This video is sponsored by Ridge and their wallet and key case. The next update for your wallet and keys is here and you can get 10% off your order by using offer code SKILLUP. Click the link below to get to it or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Minecraft Legends, what a terrific surprise. So I went into this with a mix of low expectations and confusion. On the expectations front, I recall Minecraft Dungeons, the only other Minecraft spin-off game I've played. That was like baby's first ARPG, like Diablo, but with Minecraft, only it was such a vacuous product. It was just so basic. It was like a mobile level ARPG with a Minecraft skin slapped on it. You couldn't even craft anything in a Minecraft game. It was such a waste of potential given how interesting interesting an ARPG could have been when set in the Minecraft universe. So I'm thinking to myself, if that's how Microsoft is planning to utilize this IP, I'm not too excited about the future portfolio of Minecraft spin-offs. So those are my low expectations. On the confusion side of things, I remember this game was first revealed as a sort of teaser trailer thing, and Microsoft did not explain what this game was. All of us were very confused. It just kind of showed a character riding around on a horse, swinging a stick at some bad guys. Subsequent trailers and showcases did little to clarify things. On the FPS podcast this week, my co-host Jake Baldino said that he thought it was a Dynasty Warriors game, and Gerard and Lucy said that they thought it was a sequel to Minecraft Dungeons. This is true, by the way. I even sat through a full 20 minute behind closed doors demonstration with the dev team, and even then, I still did not actually know what this video game was. Am I dumb? Absolutely. But in my defense, having now finished this game's campaign and played some of the PvP, I can absolutely understand why Microsoft have had such a tough time marketing this and also why we've had such a tough time understanding what it is because it is such a unique blending of genres, perspective and influences that no single trailer or showcase could properly demonstrate what this video game actually is. So I have two primary goals in this review. Number one, to properly explain what Minecraft Legends is and number two, to convince you to play it, because this is a really fantastic game that took some time to get into, but after it clicked, I was like, holy shit, where did this come from? I mean that for real, because I was playing through this, and at one point I had mastered the controls, I had a full understanding of the unit types and structures, I was laying siege to an enemy base while trying to manage all of my resources, and I was like, damn man, this is really good, who made this? So I looked it up, and it turns out it comes from Mojang Studios, obviously, in partnership with Blackbird Interactive. What have they made recently? Well, the critically acclaimed Hard Space Shipbreaker, the critically acclaimed Homeworld Deserts of Carrick, and they're currently working on Homeworld 3. Spoiler alert, I actually played a preview behind closed doors of Homeworld 3 and it absolutely ruled. So this is like a proper strategy game studio who make proper ass strategy games and when I learned that they were the ones behind this, it all made sense because Minecraft Legends is a proper ass strategy game made by people who really understand what they're doing and the depth of their knowledge and experience shines through in every moment of Minecraft Legends. Minecraft Legends is a third person real time strategy game that straddles action, strategy and even some 3D platforming. It has an ambitious 20 hour campaign in a procedurally generated map. It can be played co-op or solo. It has a fully featured PvP mode, hundreds of units on screen at a time as you wage battle to bring down the enemy's base. It is a deeply strategic micro intensive RTS experience if you want it to be, but it's also a really chilled out accessible third person action strategy game if that's how you'd like to play it. Its campaign is full of ingenious encounter design and enemy types that will keep you on your heels on even the normal difficulty, and its overworld map is full of bases to raid, resources to harvest, treasures to find, and secrets to unlock. There's quite a bit of jank resulting from the third person perspective, some of which will have a material impact on your enjoyment of the game, and there's definitely some balancing issues which can cause quite a bit of cheese in the latter game. These are minor issues when set against this title's cleverness, uniqueness, and imagination. Everyone's talking about Redfall right now as the next big Microsoft exclusive, and I mean, maybe it is, but Minecraft Legends is right here, right now, and it's an absolute banger that deserves a lot more spotlight than it's currently getting. So let's spend some time unpacking the fundamentals of Minecraft Legends. Even though it is a Microsoft owned game, it is in fact available on all platforms, including the Xbox, PC, PS4, Nintendo Switch, and probably xCloud at some point, I don't know. It's a discount title, just 30 US dollars, but it's also available day one on Game Pass. You do not need to own Minecraft or anything else to play it, and you do not need to have played Minecraft to know how to play this, 
because it's very much its own thing with its own approach to resource collection, building, and combat. It has both a campaign mode and a PvP mode. The campaign mode can be played online co-op with three other people, so a team of four, and enemy density and health will dynamically scale based on the number of people playing. The PvP mode supports up to eight players, so 4v4, and it offers a really truncated version of the progression and upgrade path that's available in the single player mode, such that you'll be able to build everything much quicker, and rounds should typically last between 30 minutes and two hours, depending on how skilled the players are and how much turtling is going on. The game also supports cross-play and cross-platform progression, so if you want to play on PC while your kid or your mate plays on Xbox, then that's totally fine. It can be played with a keyboard and mouse or a controller. The keyboard and mouse setup is basically as you'd expect it to be for a real-time strategy game, allowing you to use keyboard shortcuts to quickly execute build and battle commands. The controller setup is surprisingly great. Outside of the Halo Wars games, I think this is the first RTS I've played with a controller, and I played Halo Wars a long time ago, so I went into Minecraft Legends thinking I would try out the controller, but then I would go back to KBM after that. That's not what ended up happening. I found the controller set up to be so intuitive and pleasant to use that I just stuck with controller for 95% of my playthrough since it meant I could play the game on my couch instead of sitting at my desk. But I don't want to give the impression that the controller setup is easy, and this is where we might get into the topic of who is this game targeted at? And more specifically the question, is this a kid's game? I'm not sure that it is. So there are three difficulties available in the campaign. I assumed it would default to the middle difficulty, which is basically what every game does. So I played quite a few hours of it before I went in and checked that difficulty setting. Turns out I was playing on the easy difficulty and there were two more difficulties above that. Even then, I certainly wasn't finding the game easy. I mean, it wasn't like super hard, but there was absolutely some bases and some boss encounters that I found tricky and that really required me to think creatively while carefully managing build and combat commands on the fly. And I was like, is an eight-year-old gonna be able to handle this? Probably, but I think they would struggle and require some help. Then there's the controller setup. So kids who play this are probably gonna do so on a controller, not a keyboard and mouse. The controller setup is dense. A lot of functionality packed into every button with a lot of combination presses required to get anything done. It does eventually become intuitive, but the ramp up to it is tough. And again, I wonder if kids might struggle with that since I certainly found it a little tricky in those opening hours. I was talking about this with my mates the other day and Minecraft released back in 2011. I mean, if you're a kid playing Minecraft back then, you're probably 20 now. It does make sense for Microsoft to deliver spin-offs that speak to that older demographic. And I think Minecraft Legends is that. I do think it's possible for kids to enjoy this, but I think they're gonna need the help of a parent, especially in those opening hours. But yeah, teenagers and adults, this is for you, I think. You're gonna find a game that has all the charm and nostalgia and character of the Minecraft universe, combined with a whole new set of mechanics that will allow you to engage this world in a whole new way. So those are some of the fundamentals of Minecraft Legends. Let's talk now about how this campaign actually works. The premise is that an evil horde of piglins have rallied under the banners of powerful piglin leaders, and they've set up portals scattered throughout the overworld map, allowing them to travel freely between their doomed hellscape and your idyllic blocky paradise. The animals and villagers of the overworld are not equipped to deal with this threat, and so some godlike figures summon you to do the job. You arrive at the Well of Fates with just a little flag that you can wave around, and then after that, the rest is up to you. Interestingly, the overworld map you dropped onto is procedurally generated, randomly remixed topography, biomes, the location of secrets, and the placement of enemy bases. The campaign takes place on this one map only, and that will run you about 15 to 20 hours based on your skill level. But if you'd then like to play the campaign again, you'll find an entirely new map layout the next time you begin a campaign, which is a nice touch. You begin your playthrough at the Well of Fates, which is at the center of the map, and this is the place where you'll be able to gain tech upgrades. If you want to be able to collect more advanced materials like diamond or redstone, you need to build an improvement shrine and place it here. Funnily enough, there's only limited space here at the well for these upgrades, and as you approach endgame, you'll need to forego some upgrades in favor of others because there simply isn't room to put all upgrade shrines down. I wasn't the biggest fan of this, to be honest, since it felt like somewhat of a counterintuitive and frustrating restriction, but it does help preserve some of the challenge in late game, ensuring that you can't easily overwhelm your foe with endless troops or buildings courtesy of all those upgrades that you put down. Speaking of resources, this is one of the big question marks I had about Minecraft Legends. How do you collect them? Do you dig them out of the ground like in actual Minecraft? 
Well, no, and one important thing to note about Legends is that despite its voxel appearance, you cannot manipulate the terrain in any way. It's totally fixed in place and cannot be dug or blasted away. So how do you collect resources then? Well, this is where your allays come in. They're essentially little fairies that do your bidding, namely mining and building. To mine something, you select the relevant resource from your hotbar, and then you place a gathering node over a section of the map. At that point, the allay will gather any resource in that area. So if you drop the wood collection node over a bunch of trees, the allay will start collecting wood. If you drop it on a diamond or coal or iron deposit, it will then collect those resources. Different regions of the map hold different types of materials. So if you find yourself short on diamond, you're gonna to wanna to find some tundra since that's where that spawns. Similarly, if it's redstone you need, you're gonna to wanna to find a swamp, etc. Resource collection in this game is actually a fairly painless affair since it happens while you're exploring the map. You'll be hunting for new villages to liberate or new enemy bases to conquer. And while you do that, you can just drop a resource collecting allay on a bunch of resource deposits without even having to stop. It's like drive by resource collection. That's a really smart approach to this since you will need to be collecting a lot of resources to supply all of your troop creation and building. Battles in Minecraft Legends are not set up to be one-sided conflicts where you can protect all of your troops while taking out the enemies. Instead, this is a war of attrition, and you are specifically meant to churn through hundreds of troops in a single battle or replace dozens of destroyed structures in a single defense. Every skirmish or siege is a huge drain on resources, so the fact that replenishing them is so easy is a central pillar to this game's success, since the game would have been a real slog if the resource economy was dialed in any other way. While you're on the hunt for more resources to feed your war machine, you will be exploring this beautiful world. And I mean, it's really beautiful, it's stunning. I've actually never properly played Minecraft. I was too old by the time it came along and I haven't made the time to go back to it, but I have seen it rendered in different ways. I've seen the OG style. I've seen the ray tracing update a few years ago. I saw the Minecraft Telltale game from a while back and I've seen Minecraft Dungeons. Here in Legends, this is easily the best I've ever seen Minecraft looking. It is such a beautiful game that has made me love this blocky aesthetic more than I ever have before. It's trees and rock formations and mountains each have such color and character and the way all of it is lit is stunning. There's this dynamic day night cycle that slowly bends color from blinding yellow to a neutral illuminating sunshine to a warm afternoon glow to a purple moonlit night. At 4K, the game ran beautifully on an RTX 2080 Ti, no issues whatsoever, and it just looked gorgeous the entire time. It also sounded fantastic. One of the things that you're given at the start of your journey is a special magic loot. This is what you'll use to command the allays and issue instructions to your troops. Each and every command in the game has its own accompanying loot melody. And as you lay down new improvement shrines, you will learn new melodies allowing you to build or collect new things. And then there's the music, which is fantastic. It's really chill and relaxing when you're exploring the overworld, but when it's time to throw down, it belts out these epic orchestral scores that have a lot of Lord of the Rings energy. The comparison to Lord of the Rings is really apt because when you start settling into this game's combat and start focusing on the bigger enemy bases and boss encounters, the whole thing starts to feel very reminiscent of those epic battles at Helm's Deep or the Gates of Mordor. The fact that this is played in third person and the fact that the focus is on attrition rather than asymmetrical advantage really transports you to the front lines of a brutal, knock em down, drag em out conflict in a way that traditional RTS just couldn't. You are both warrior and commander here, and the careful balance between those two responsibilities is how Minecraft Legends is able to straddle both the action and strategy genres, and that's really what makes it so unique. Many years ago, there was a game studio called Shiny. You may remember them for games such as Earthworm Jim and The Matrix, but I remember them for Sacrifice, a revolutionary take on the RTS genre that saw you command troops from the battlefield while controlling a hero in third person perspective. This game fucking ruled because it gave you a view of the battlefield that no other RTS had done to that point. And it was always curious to me why no one had carried this forward. I mean, that was released 23 years ago. And how many third person RTS games have there been since then? Not many. Mountain Blade? I don't know, probably some others. I don't know what they are. 
point is, it's a very underserviced strategy niche, and it's surprising that Minecraft of all things should be one of the re-entry points. The starting point for Minecraft Legends is to understand its ambition as an action strategy game, because combining those things naturally necessitates some compromises at either end of the spectrum. If you are looking for a straight action game, you will find Legends to be overly complex and finicky. Similarly, if you are looking for a straight strategy game, you will find Legends lacks a lot of the tools, systems, and mechanics that would allow you to operate more strategically. The game is forever trying to occupy a midpoint between these two objectives, and I think it absolutely nails it, but if you aren't up for that midpoint, then Legends isn't for you. The other thing you should understand about Minecraft Legends is that it's not a base building focused game. You will not create one central base and use it as the primary engine for your war machine. Instead, you're like a roaming conqueror, moving from place to place, setting up temporary fortifications, recruiting from the local population, and riding out to meet the enemy wherever they may be. For example, let's say you stumble upon a piglin outpost somewhere and you want to lay siege to it. Your first order of business is often to build some spawners, allowing you to spawn in troops. You'll put them down at that location just on the edge of their base and you'll summon in a few troops. You'll rally them by standing near them and pressing your rally button, and then they will follow you into battle, attacking anything in their path, but also responding to whatever orders you may issue. This is one of the things that contributes to that resource churn that I mentioned earlier. Rather than create a central base full of permanent structures, you're constantly spinning up lots of smaller bases that support your more immediate ambitions. This naturally forces you to engage these building systems more regularly than you otherwise might if you were just building once in a central location. So what about these troops? Well, this is where the limitations of Minecraft Legends start to kick in. There are eight troop types ranging from melee based block dudes to little stick based blow dart dudes to enemies that can stun to creepers who act like kamikaze and blow themselves up for big area damage. They all fill a very specific role like the block dudes being strong against buildings and the blow darts being strong against troops. But the overall suite of troops does lack distinctiveness. There is no central dedicated tank unit, for example. There are no flying units. There aren't any support units except for a healer. There aren't units that provide cover from ranged attacks except for one hero unit who you might find late in the game. There are no ballista units, etc. The units that are there absolutely work, but their simplicity does limit your strategic options and again, forces you into a battle of attrition more than anything else. Furthermore, commanding these troops is a very manual process, and I expect some people will find it laborious. To issue commands to troops, you first need to rally them by standing near them. At that point, they will follow you and you can issue commands to all of them, or just to some of them if you open up a more detailed command menu and select specific unit types. However, once you have issued a command to them, you then need to run back over to that unit and rally it again to regain control of it. You can't create troop groupings supported by shortcuts that let you quickly reselect troops. Troops. You need to manually stand near them and rally them every time you want to issue a new command. So this is smart on one level because it naturally forces you to run around the battlefield like a crazy person, hoovering up your troops with your rally banner and frantically issuing commands. If you were able to just stand back and quickly select and command units from a distance, the game would probably feel more strategic, but it would feel a lot less scrappy. And I think the scrappiness is a really core part of this formula. So I like this, but I do suspect many people will find it cumbersome and annoying. On top of that, there are definitely challenges with this third person perspective with how tricky it can be to command your troops and with how much the AI will struggle to execute on your commands. On the matter of perspective, trying to get a full view of the battlefield can sometimes be tricky as structures and topography can make things awkward in a way that never impact RTS games played in that traditional top-down perspective. You do get a more immersive and visceral experience here on the ground, but you do trade away a lot of visual clarity as a result. The process of issuing commands is also full of the same compromise. It's usually just about pointing your troops towards something and then hoping they'll figure it out. So if you want them to take down an enemy structure, you'd point them toward it and off they go. But they may also start swinging at a nearby enemy. It's kind of up to them. You can command your troops to attack specific units, but doing so requires you to re-rally your troops and then bring up a menu to issue a specific command and then move your cursor over an enemy unit that may or may not be moving amidst a frantic sea of foes. So it's tricky right? Compared to a classic RTS where you just drag a box over your troops and right click an enemy, this is a lot more imprecise and cumbersome. Finally, there's definitely some funky AI and pathing going on, making it difficult to predict what your troops will do in a given moment. Trying to lead them through water or across bridges or up and down ledges or between more narrow built up environments can see your troops get stuck on things very regularly, at which point they're no longer under your command and must be manually re-rallied. Often your troops should be attacking a nearby enemy and they just 
don't. They just stand there and you're like, come on guys, pick it up. But yeah, obviously they're just not feeling it or something. So I'm listing all this stuff off, not to say, hey, this game sucks, but rather to say, you gotta be okay with some trade-offs in the strategy department, and you gotta be okay with some jank in the execution. If you're okay with those things, then yeah, things start to get really, really good. The campaign experience ultimately pits you against three mini bosses and one final boss. The three mini bosses each have three major bases spread out across the map, so nine in total, and taking out these nine bases is ultimately the focus of the campaign. You need to work up toward that though, since at first you only have a limited number of troops you can build, a limited number of resources you can collect and carry, and so that's where the exploration kicks in. Roaming about the world, collecting resources, taking out smaller piglin outposts, liberating villages. You'll actually gain new troop types by liberating them from villages. You'll discover the creeper village or the zombie village, and each of them are under occupation by the enemy, freeing them gives you permanent access to this troop type unless their village is recaptured at night. So part of the gameplay rhythm is actually to revisit and fortify and protect villages to keep your supply lines of troops open. This is yet another thing forcing you to move across all parts of the map at once, as you need to be ready to respond to any village calling for help. Anyway, once you get rolling, it's time to lay siege to some of those main bases, and this is where the fun really begins. A standard piglin outpost may have two or three enemy spawners and two or three defensive towers. These bases can have like 20 enemy spawners and 20 towers, hundreds of enemies spawning at you at once. Each of these three boss types brings a unique conceit to their defense. So one of them, the Horde of the Bastion, is all about invulnerable walls, and you need to snake your way through these multi-level bases full of towers above and around you. Another one, the Horde of the Spore, like to position themselves up really high, and you need to somehow scale these cliffs while under constant ballista fire. The other faction, the Horde of the Hunt, will just endlessly spawn enemies at you, so many that it is impossible for you to spawn enough troops to meet them head on. So in each of these instances, you need to come up with a strategy for how to push into their base. For the spore battles, the ones on the high plateaus, I had to build ramps between each platform and defend them with troops who would act like meat shields as I frantically rushed other troops up and into the next layer of defense. For the hunt enemies, the ones that just endlessly spawn, I basically had to build a base in their base. I had to slowly cleanse the land of corruption so I could build on it, and then I had to edge forward a line of towers that gave my troops enough cover fire to advance. These battles against the hunt would take like an hour or more because I had to be so careful and methodical about where I was building, protecting it while it was being built, reinforcing it after that, and just doing that over and over again, inch by inch until I had my foothold. That was so fun. I absolutely loved it, and it was just epic to see hundreds of enemies pouring towards me endlessly, knowing that I had finally built a defensive line strong enough to withstand them. The Bastion Horde is where things kind of came a little undone in terms of game balance. Unfortunately, you'll likely discover that your skeleton archers are very strong with an absurdly long range and the ability to hit practically anything at any angle. They trivialize this enemy faction in a way that doesn't seem interesting or fun. And I expect Blackbird will want to make some changes to how these units function in future, because right now you can absolutely ride them to an easy campaign victory. But those units aside, you are looking at a 15 to 20 hour campaign, taking down a total of 10 epic bases. The final one being unbelievably huge, and by and large, most aspects of this game are so taut in their design and balance. The economy feels dialed in just right. The focus on skirmish-style assaults and rapid construction works brilliantly. The range of enemy unit types and base layouts necessitate so much creativity and adaptation on your part. Exploring every corner of the overworld map rewards economic and combat upgrades that will make you far stronger without ever throwing the balance of power too far in your favor. Crucially, it all has this breathless sense of pace and action to it. You cannot settle into that familiar RTS thing where you just farm up resources and stockpile infinite troops in a central base and then march them to a certain victory. You are this nomadic warrior conducting a guerrilla style of warfare, appearing from nowhere to blitzkrieg and unsuspecting outposts, and then disappearing back into the mountains. Or you're laying prolonged siege to a base that would seem all but impenetrable were it not for your ingenuity and your will. There are compromises made to make this sort of experience possible, and not all of it works as well as it should, but those compromises and those shortcomings are more than made up for by the sheer joy of seeing your plan come together in messy, chaotic conquest and carnage.
So rounding out this review is a brief look at the PvP. I only played a few rounds of this, but yeah, man, it's full of promise. It supports up to 4v4 and the goal is to take down the enemy's fountain. You go through the same resource collection and upgrade thing that you do in the campaign, only it happens much faster here. So you should be able to unlock most of the essential building elements within your first 10 to 20 minutes of play. At all times though, it's about the strategy you'd like to employ. If you'd like to Zerg rush the enemy in the early game and cripple their fortifications, you can. If you'd like to turtle up and hoard resources, you can. One of the best strategies is to build a redstone launcher, the only long range catapult in the game, and one capable of leveling a base very quickly unless it's dealt with fast. If you can sneak one of those into a hidden position, fortify it a little with some towers and some troops, you can end the game right then and there very quickly. Of course, if you're only interested in the PvE side of this game, then good news. Blackbird and Mojang have positioned this as a sort of live service without the battle pass or any of that sort of shit. They plan to deliver new content updates each month, which will be centered on new campaign style challenges. I'm guessing it's going to be different styles of enemy encounters, similar to the way that each boss enemy had their unique conceit during the campaign, but obviously that's a total guess. But if this game were to never get a single piece of new content, I would still be exceptionally happy with this package. I cannot believe that this is like 30 US dollars, by the way. I've played plenty of $70 games recently that haven't had anywhere near as much creativity, content, or delivered anywhere near as much enjoyment as this one has. This is like an indie price tag for a AAA quality strategy game, one that has the broadest possible appeal to young and old, to Minecraft fans, and to Minecraft first timers. Its unique genre bending approach to strategy isn't going to be to everyone's taste, and there are a few kinks here and there that hold it back from reaching its full potential, but I think this is just so clever and so well made, and it was such a joy to play through. It's on Game Pass, I really recommend taking a chance on this one. There's something special here, and if you can push through those awkward opening hours, I think you'll find what I'm talking about, and I think you'll love it. At least, I hope you will. So anyway, that's my review, I recommend Minecraft Legends. I don't know about you guys, but I've noticed that I'm using wallets in a very different way these days. It used to be that you have to have a big wallet to carry around your license, your bank cards, your credit cards, your gym membership, your blockbuster rental card. Those are the days. Now, a lot of that stuff has shifted to apps or those businesses have just ceased to exist. I pay for stuff with my phone or watch a lot of the time now rather than cash. I just don't have a need for a big wallet stuffed full of cash, cards and old receipts. But I still need a wallet. There are a few cards I want to carry with me at all times, and I do like to have a bit of cash for me just in case. This is one of the many reasons I made the jump to Ridge wallets years ago. I downsized to a sleeker wallet that still let me carry what I needed without having to carry around that big bulky leather wallet of yesteryear. Ridge wallets are wallets evolved. Store all of your essential cards, your cash using either the money strap or money clip, protect yourself from scammers with RFID protection and look like a classy dude because these things are sleek and stylish and come in a range of colors and materials allowing you to rock whatever look works for you. Ridge don't just do wallets though. More recently, I was one of the first people to get my hands on their new key case, and that has been something that I also love, and I just can't imagine going back to a big, messy clump of keys. There are other products there too, like their excellent backpack, their bolt-action pens, and tons more. All of it is worth a look, and all of it is 10% off when you use offer code SKILLUP at checkout. Visit ridge.com forward slash SKILLUP and get 10% off store-wide. Link below in the description and the pinned comment. Thanks, Ridge, for sponsoring the channel for 2023, and a big thank you to you out there for watching the videos, since Ridge would not be supporting the channel if it weren't for you guys. Appreciate it, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.